Welcome to Life as a Patient Doctor, where we transform my blog into an audio experience. I'm your host, MedPsych Moss, navigating healthcare as a patient and a future MD. Embark on a journey of vulnerability as we uncover the realities of trauma and developing resilience. Hit that follow and join us on this extraordinary life as a patient doctor. And now for the show. Hello, everyone. Today, I'll be reading from the blog post, Living with Chronic Medical Conditions as a Clinical Medical Student. In the first picture, it says, we do not need to look sick to still suffer from physical and mental health conditions. We need to change the culture of medicine to normalize doctors being human who similarly suffer and have challenges with their health. And that picture is by the Warrior Connect and Band-Aid of the Heart on Instagram. They made that beautiful picture. I wrote this blog post about a year and a half ago. So this is my experience going through my third year, which is the clinical rotations in medical school while experiencing health conditions and disabilities. So I wrote, we don't need to look sick to still be sick and suffering. We need to change the culture of medical education to normalize medical students and physicians that they're human and can take time to address their health. Medical professionals are people too. That means we can have physical and mental illnesses, which are not always visible to the naked eye. In the disability world, we like to call these invisible disabilities compared to ones that are blatantly obvious to the eye because of maybe mobility devices like a wheelchair or how we interact with the world around us. In the AAMC Medical School Graduation Questionnaire from 2020 All School Summary Report, 7.6 of graduating medical students self-reported they had a disability. Of these, the top three were ADHD, mobility, chronic health disability, or a learning disability. I guess that's four. (laughs) If you grow up in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, or at least being able to do well enough to get to into medical school, we hadn't really thought about needing additional support. And so like from my experience, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and I also talk about in other blog posts, it wasn't until my second year of medical school where I actually failed the step one exam that I realized that my chronic health conditions were a disability and were actually, I could benefit from accommodations. According to the same questionnaire, only 52.6 of students with disabilities reported being provided accommodations from their medical school. The top reason for people not being provided was because they selected, they felt they didn't need accommodations or they selected for other reasons. Thankfully, the ones who did request accommodations, only 2.9 reported being denied. And that's huge. I feel like from my own experience, so I have two pictures. One reported they had a disability. Now, I do want to say not a lot of people either know that they have a disability or don't feel comfortable stating it out loud because they fear there's repercussions, whether they will not get into residency or they'll be looked down upon their peers, even though this was a survey that is supposed to be fully de-identified. You just never know. And I believe that that could be why one of the reasons people didn't self-disclose. Then right below it, it also says all the different types of disabilities. So I mentioned the top three. Top fourth is learning disability at 1.9%. So 61% of the people who self-reported had ADHD. 13% said they had a chronic health disability. 3.3% were deaf or hard of hearing. 9.3% said they had a learning disability. 1.9% said they had a mobility disability. 15.3%, that's a lot, stated they had a psychological disability, so mental illness, anxiety, depression, bipolar, things like that. 
2.4% they had stated they had a visual disability and 6% said they had other. So in total, that was 1,273 fourth year medical students that were graduating medical school back in 2020, self-disclosed they had a disability. That's huge. And I'm not sure if I, I believe I've already done this report too for when I graduate medical school in four months. So they haven't published that information yet. Okay, and then the next thing is the accommodations. So for the people who said yes, they had a disability, 52.6% said they did. Like I stated before, very few percent were denied if they actually requested it. So I think it's really just hard, the self-disclosure and asking for help like anything else. It's really hard. Next, I write, we need to advocate and educate other medical students to seek disability accommodations when they're struggling in class or in the clinical environment. And then I said, see blog post requesting disabilities accommodations and accessibility needs. So I'm working on a blog post right now to write up everything I can find regarding disabilities and accommodations, including recordings from other groups that have discussed accommodations and all that and also how to request accommodations while you're applying to residency, when you're in residency, and then when you're a physician. So next, I understand why people wouldn't request disability accommodations. Our medical community sees it as a taboo topic and it is seen as a weakness. Read more of my blog post, Surviving the Taboos of Medical School, which is also my very first podcast episode. Unfortunately, there have been multiple situations where I myself have felt out of place for having a disability. Frequently, I have heard residents talk about themselves not going to their own doctor as they know they should because they're young and healthy. It has made me feel uncomfortable because I have so many medical conditions, but on the outside, I do also look young and healthy. I say that to just really be aware of what you're saying. Like you never know what other people around you have disabilities or have health needs. And especially if you're a resident and you have other medical students, they're looking up to you. And it's really painful to hear that you're not as young and healthy like them. Read below some journal entries I had during my third year clinical rotations where I struggled with balancing my health while I had disabilities and a clinical medical student, feeling out of place in my neurology rotation. Today, I felt embarrassed when I had to sit down in a chair while the head neurologist attending my residents and peers stood and leaned against the wall. But I knew my body and I knew I couldn't stay standing still that long. I know I can stand in place during short rounds where we only stay with each hospital station for about five minutes in the morning. However, this particular attending does almost an hour long round with each patient. It is just too much for my body. At the end of each week, I seem to flare up in pain all over my body, especially my low backs and my legs. They just feel like lead in, or searing in pain. I get so nervous and self-conscious that I'm being judged when I sit down, which in some sense, they are judging me because that is the point of medical education, constantly being judged for our behavior, which then affects our evaluations and grades. Therefore, I don't know how much I can be myself and acknowledge my own needs. Reading through my accommodations letter, I am allowed health breaks. It doesn't say bathroom or me sitting down in clinic could be considered health break, but it does make me feel a little bit better if I do get in trouble. Also, we know that sitting down with patients at their eye level, especially during difficult conversations, is more comforting, makes them feel heard, and it feels like we're spending more time as their doctor. And I do want to step aside and say, like, I still struggle this even during my fourth year. I'm constantly finding a spare stool or a spare chair that I can sit down when we're in a patient clinic room. And Patient hospital rooms are really not built 
for the physician and their huge medical team to sit down. It's really built of like a hospital bed and then doctors come in and out, they stand around the patient, then they leave, which from a patient perspective, that feels very overwhelming to have the doctors just like standing right on top of you. It it really kind of perpetuates that doctor patient unequal power dynamic versus if we do find a way to sit down or crouch down, it does help because it feels more comforting, feels more empathetic. I usually grab, there's sometimes a chair in every single room that's in the little closet. So if you check, you can always open a door or sometimes there's a little bench with like family members. I ask if I can sit down there. I don't like sitting on the bed because that feels very much their own personal space. And then also being a patient myself, when a doctor sat on the bed, it feels kind of awkward and feels like they're invading our space, especially like in the hospital bed, you're usually naked underneath your gown. So it even feels even more invading, especially if someone comes from a trauma background, it feels um, very overwhelming to have someone you don't know even if it's your doctor, someone where you have a professional relationship, just being on your bed. Think about it. If you were like at home, a family friend wouldn't just sit on your bed. Maybe they would come to the designated couch in the living room. Same thing when we're in the medical space, we need to use those appropriate chairs in the room. I'm going to go to the next part. Seeing imaging tools. I had an interesting interaction today where some of my classmates really wanted to see the CT and MRI machines. I was very confused. Why were they so excited? And then I realized they had never seen one of these before. Huh. When I myself had been in CT MRI multiple times for multiple reasons. Same thing happened with an EMG, and I have a picture of me laying down on my stomach wearing one of the hospital gowns. I'm wearing a mask because it was during COVID. I got um, an EMG when I was still trying to work up why I had so much chronic pain flares, um, especially during my third year of medical school. So one could have been more causing the other or exasperating, but I still had an EMG just in case to check if there was something specifically wrong with my muscles. So I'm sitting right next to the EMG machine. And I said, been there, done that, which I thought was pretty funny. Okay, I have a line. And then I go to um, the next picture where I see my very bloated stomach, which looks like I'm at least second trimester pregnant. And I'm not. It's just bloated endometriosis. And I'm wearing my scrub pants. So I'm probably either on the way to or from a clinical rotation, or I'm just wearing scrub pants because that's the only pant I can find that has more flexible pants that don't hurt. I wrote endometriosis and chronic pain flare, pain, fatigue, weakness everywhere. Some days I get home and just collapse and sleep for one to two hours. Other days I can manage to help cook or go for a short ice cream or dog walk. Although after dinner, I just lay on my couch fighting to keep my eyes open as I try to do you world practice questions with a heating pad around my low back and my legs elevated. I'm very thankful that this hasn't happened in a long time because fourth year medical school is thankfully a lot easier and we don't have like daily 10, 12, 14 hour days. Next, this week was difficult with the 90 plus heat on the 12th floor of the hospital tower. I would sometimes get hot flashes if I wore my white coat during rounds and sometimes had to use a wet paper towel to lower my body temperature. I also, I actually also would grab ice packs. It was horrible. Or I would just drink lots of water or like go to the bathroom and like dump water on my head or neck just because I was so hot and heat flares my pain. It's horrible. 
I also wore my nicer scrubs or light weight tops and hope my attending wouldn't care if I was the only med student without my white coat on. You really don't have to wear it. And a lot of the residents don't even wear white coats, but this particular attending really liked us to wear it. I really wish I was brave enough to tell that attending, like, I can't wear it. I'm super hot. I don't need to explain that I have a medical condition or I'm having hot flashes in my mid-20s. Next journal entry. Today, I woke in a full flare with all my muscles aching and feeling like I was going to throw up from the pain. What do I do? Do I take a health day? Do I call in sick? What do I even say? I can't say I'm in pain. Society and culture of medicine and even COVID has told me to say I have a fever or food poisoning, etc. Those are the appropriate things to call out sick for, or at least to say you're sick. However, that is not fair. And I do have the right to take both a health and a sick day. <sighs> but it's so hard emotionally to say that I'm too weak to, or in pain to go into the clinic or hospital. Here are some goals in my plan going forward. One, keep notifying new residents and attendings about my accommodations letter. Two, sit near a patient when interviewing them or during rounds by even bringing a stool from the nurse's station. Three, keep doctor's appointments scheduled in the late afternoon because we're normally dismissed by then. Make more doctor's appointments to make plan on adding in more neuropathic pain meds. And lastly, be brave enough to notify my team on taking a health day. Those are great plans. And I would say half of them I've done. It's the accommodations letter. It's notifying them. I still struggle with telling them because automatically in our school, the accommodations led sent to the clerkship director and it's the clerkship director's job to then send it to the attendings. It's not supposed to be our job to tell the attendings, but sometimes the attendings don't know or don't read their email and then the residents don't receive them. So it is hard. And then next journal entry. Flare while on clinical internal medicine rounds. Update. I woke up at 4 a.m. this morning, almost screaming in pain in my right lower abdominal quadrant and low back. I went to the bathroom and just collapsed on the floor, hoping the coolness of the floor would provide some relief. It eventually did and provided me the energy to stand up and grab my heating pad, fell back asleep until my alarm went off at 6 a.m. Note though, that's dangerous. Try not to do that. Make sure you have a heating pad that does get cooler or turn off as a set amount of time. Thankfully, I have a one that's plugged into the wall that does automatically turn off. I probably kept putting on the sleep mode until 6.30. I knew I had to get up because I had post-call rounds and had to be at the hospital at 7 a.m. I gulped down my pain meds and the rest of the daily medications and headed into the hospital to do my pre-rounds. When I was talking to my patients to see how they were doing, I was able to distract my brain momentarily and the pain pills helped me remain standing for quick check-ins. However, by the time we came back together to do our rounds as a whole team, I could feel myself starting to drift off and the pain came back. I kept blinking my eyes to prevent myself from crying or letting my team know that something was wrong. I tried to listen to my residents present their patients, but my brain was all foggy. I felt like it was listening through a door. I tried to keep myself busy and focused on reviewing the CTs and the x-ray with the patient we were talking about. But eventually, I realized that it wasn't going to work. And apparently, we had moved on to another patient. My stomach was enlarging by the minute and pressing on my scrub pants, elastic band. That is super painful when that happens. I put my legs up on a nearby chair and tried to straighten out my body and massage my abdominal muscles, which were spazzing in response to the endometriosis pain flare. 
I texted my senior resident across room and told her that I had endometriosis and was having an endo flare. So that was the first time I disclosed to her. I should have done that before, but I didn't think it was necessary, but obviously it was. But thankfully, she reassured me that I could go home. And I responded, I wanted to stick it out until after rounds. Only an hour left, right? I tried to wait it out. It didn't work. It got to the point that I had to get up to go to the bathroom and prevent myself from vomiting because it was so painful. Bursting into tears or collapsing in the middle of the hospital general medical floor. This is when I knew I had to go home. Now. I debated calling in this morning. We do have sick and wellness days, but my ego and society told me that I could push through it because we are strong. We are medical students. We are future doctors. It was a Saturday post call. So we would only be here for six hours. Instead, I went in for just three and a half hours. Really, that was a bit of a waste of time where I could have been sleeping and healing if I had just called in that day. After I got back from the bathroom, I quickly touched base with my senior resident and attending, grabbed my things, and dragged myself to the elevator. Down nine floors and a very, very long and slow and painful walk to my parked car. What would have been worse Calling in and being embarrassed for calling in or doing this, suffering and leaving mid-rounds. We, me included, need to put our own bodies and health first, especially in the healthcare field. How can we give 100% care to others when we ourselves are not even at our 100%? And that's it. If you want to read more, you can read the blog post, Living with Chronic Medical Conditions as a Clinical Medical Student. Now, if you haven't already, make sure to rate and follow wherever you're listening to the podcast. That allows more individuals to be able to access these podcasts and we can break down barriers together. Also follow me on social media at MedPsychMoss and get more resources on being a patient and a future doctor taking care of other patients at MedPsychMoss.com. Thank you so much and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.